Good evening. Welcome. This lecture is sponsored by the School of Art, the Art Education Program, and the Walton Family Charitable Support Foundation. And my name is Angela Laporte, but before I begin, I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional homelands and territories of the local indigenous peoples, including the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw Nations where the University of Arkansas is currently located. A portion of the Trail of Tears runs through our campus where the Cherokee, Choctaw, Muscogee, Chicks Chickasaw, and Seminole nations pass through during this forced removal. By acknowledging the past, we recognize our responsibilities in relation to ongoing settler colonialism that eradicates indigenous peoples, cultures, and languages as well as those colonial projects that dispossess indigenous lands. This statement is an invitation to recognize indigenous presence now in our communities and to reckon possible ways to support indigenous survivance. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Dr. Pamela Harris Lawton who is the Florence Gaskins Harper Endowed Chair in Art Education at the Maryland Institute College of Art. She was born into a family of artists, writers, dancers, singers, actors, and musicians. As a fifth generation educator from Washington, DC, she spent much of her formative years engaged in the arts with her grandmother, great uncles and aunts, cousins, parents, and siblings, as a form of learning about the world and how to survive and thrive as a woman of color. These intergenerational arts-based lessons stayed with her. Her scholarly and artistic research revolve around visual narrative and intergenerational arts learning in community settings with specific emphasis on BIPOC communities. As an artist, educator, researcher, Lawton's artwork is grounded in social justice, seeking to illuminate contemporary issues, cultural traditions, and the stories of people impacted by them. Lawton earned a BA degree in studio art and sociology from the University of Virginia, an MFA in printmaking from Howard University, and a doctor of education in the College Teaching of Art for Teachers College, Columbia University. Honors include the Pearl Greenberg Award that she received recently for teaching and research in lifelong learning from the NAEA 2021, the Grace Hampton Lecture, NAEA 2021, Fulbright Distinguished, Distinguished Chair at the University of Edinburgh, Associate Artist at the Tate Exchange in London, Southeastern Region Higher Education Art Educator, Art Educator Award in 2017, the Betty Foster Outstanding Teacher Award at the Corcoran College of Art and Design in 2010, and Artist Residencies in San Miguel de Allende, Mexico, and Montpelier Cultural Arts Center in Laurel, Maryland. In addition to numerous publications and exhibitions, Lawton's artworks are in the Tate Britain Library Artist Books Collection, Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, University of Edinburgh, Scotland, Virginia Commonwealth University, Cabell Library Special Collection of Artist Books, the College of Health and Human Services, University of North Carolina at Charlotte, Teachers College, Columbia University, Morgan State University, Georgetown University, and many more. Um, at this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Pamela Harris Lawton. Good evening, everyone. I am deeply honored by the invitation to speak with you about my community based teaching and research. In these challenging times when marginalized voices are speaking truth to power through art, social media, and peaceful protests in solidarity with co conspirators. As artist educators, we have an opportunity to educate about disparities and foster equitable social change. And we can do this by reconceptualizing our art curriculum to include the untold histories 
of place and people, account for learners' personal art making preferences, culture, interests, and concerns. We can make them aware of community and social engagement issues and the ways in which art making can enact social justice. For the past 20 years, I have, been, I have attempted to do this through my art, teaching, and research practice, which I view holistically. Each of these practices impact the other and are inextricably intertwined in a symbiotic relationship. My practice is greatly influenced by my upbringing, which I won't say again, because Angela already said about that. Um, and my scholarly and artistic research revolve around visual narrative and intergenerational arts learning in community settings. Um, and, and specifically with BIPOC communities, probably because I am a black woman and I grew up in those communities and I always like to try to find a way to engage with them through art. As an artist educator researcher, my artwork is grounded in social practice, seeking to illuminate contemporary issues, cultural traditions, and the stories of people impacted by them. So I kind of refer to my holistic practice as art stories, which you can see this big banner going across the title slide here. And what are art stories? Art stories are shared oral histories, performances, collaborative written identity pieces and or visual illustrations, forms a narrative that examine life themes related to the psychosocial development of people. They are also a concept an age integrated arts learning curriculum theory conceived of as a means of creating more inclusive and empowered communities through arts-based narrative or story sharing. They are exhibited, read, and performed for others as a means of furthering multicultural understanding through art and story sharing. And finally, art stories are community-based educational research projects that examine the storied nature of learning, how narrative co-inquiry enhances the social and moral education of youth and creates sustainable learning partnerships between schools, communities, and arts organizations. So how do I define community-based art education? Let's see if I can get to that. Why? Ah, oh, here we go. Community-based art education or CBAE happens with and in communities in either informal settings with learners of all ages, experiences, and backgrounds. It provides opportunities for participants from communities of difference and similarity to meet on common ground through an art activity. It takes an asset focused approach, and this is really important as a means of connecting institutions to communities. In other words, instead of thinking about, oh, this poor community over here, they don't have this or that, we need to help them. You need to look and see what they bring to the table because everybody has assets that they bring to a relationship. And it allows participants to develop a rapport with people and communities they may seldom encounter in daily life and making connections between their art education in the classroom setting and how it can be applied in the, in the broader world. So I see art as a call to action and call is a acronym for connecting, collaborating and creating through arts-based activity that's asset-centered, listening to the stories and experiences of others to learn and build more inclusive and equitable communities and practices. With this in mind, um, I developed a conceptual framework and don't laugh, it does, I love acronyms, <laughs> um, to help others who are interested in doing this kind of work through institutions or just on their own as artists, teaching artists out in communities, to think about a conceptual framework to help develop these sorts of projects. And the acronym is ERECT, which means to build. So erecting frameworks to build partnerships. So the ERECT uh, acronym is five basic guiding principles to help uh, people figure out the best ways to organize, plan, implement, and assess, because assessment's an important piece. You know, once you've done something, how do you know that it accomplished what you wanted it to accomplish? So assessment is an important piece that we often forget about. So the first E is for educational. CBAE provides teaching and learning opportunities for stakeholders, um, artists, educators who are facilitating the projects, and the broader community through art. 
Um, and it also promotes story sharing. So that's one way we learn. We learn from telling stories about experience to one another. That's how we learn about other people and other people's experiences. The R stands for reciprocal. Um, there shouldn't be a hierarchical relationship in a community-based project. What you want to do is find a way for people to meet on common ground. Certainly there's someone who's facilitating because they might have a certain skill set. But the idea is for everybody to be to feel like they have an equal contribution and that their voice will be heard and listened to and appreciated. So this is one of the ways that you um, build rapport and trust and show that you value diversity and inclusion um, and build connections across communities of difference by developing an understanding. Oops. Um, the next E is empowering. Now, I don't think this always happens, but it's certainly a goal. So involvement in CBAE and narrative co-inquiry provides opportunities for self and communal empowerment and efficacy. C for collaborative. Uh, CBAE programs are designed to be collaborative experiences in which each person has a meaningful role and shares their knowledge. And I'll give you an example of this um, when I talk about some of the projects that um, I've done. And T is transformational. We can't guarantee that everybody's going to walk away feeling transformed. Um, but what often happens is when a person or persons are involved in a community based project, they have a sense of empowerment. That, that happens for them. And they feel that they are personally transformed when they walk away. Their communities might be transformed. They've met people they might not normally meet who may have transformed them in some way or another. So that's a, that's a more lofty goal, but it's certainly one that can happen when you're involved in these sorts of projects. So what I've done is I've sort of um, pulled the projects up in a way so that you can kind of see where the framework fits in. So this project was a community quilt um, project that I did, uh, I guess it must have been about 2006 or so. And the reason that I wanted to do it was because the university where I was teaching at the time was in a suburban area. And most of my students never even got downtown. You know, they never, they never even really got into the city very much. And so I felt like it would be important for them to have that experience. And I was contacted by the Urban Ministry Center in Charlotte. This was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And they had programming there for the homeless population. They didn't refer to them as the homeless. They referred to them as the, the neighbors, which I thought was a much better term. But, you know, so many of us see homeless people. We walk by them and we just wonder, gosh, you know, I wonder why they're homeless. You know, do they have a mental, do they have mental issues? Are they just, you know, what's the deal with them? And we don't even stop and think about, you know, what this person's life may have been like before they became homeless. So I took a small group of students and one of my colleagues who was in the foundations program. And we talked to the administrator there and he said, well, we'd really like to do a project that would involve everyone, but it would also kind of highlight what happens here at this center. And so the center had been in this um, small train depot and then they, so they got money to build a brand new facility directly across the street. So what we wound up doing was I wanted my students to learn from these people that they, they saw on the street, you know, um, as people who they might not have thought had much to offer and to, to learn, you know, to get an education about what it's like to be someone who doesn't necessarily have the same things you do, doesn't necessarily mean that they're a lesser person. So we got involved in this quilt project and we were talking to the people who were the neighbors there and looking to see what they were bringing into that community. So they had developed a community at this center. So we wound up making two quilts with them. One was actually like a quilt of the center, the old building across the street. And then if you could see up here, let's see all the way up in the upper right corner, you see what looks like two people playing soccer and some greenery. So that, that is a celebration of the two buildings that comprise this center and some of the programming there. They had a, a homeless soccer team, actually, that played in an international soccer match. 
They had um, a gardening program where they sold herbs to local restaurants. And then they had the art program where um, they gave art supplies to the neighbors and the neighbors would make these paintings and different works. And then they have a big auction to, to support all the programming. People would come in from all around and buy the, buy the work. This last quilt that you can see barely down, down in the lower right is actually um, a, a celebration of the people we met. Some of the people we met who were, who were artists there in that community and their stories there on the, on the windowsill. So it turned out that um, we were surprised by the people that we met. One person spoke six different languages and he became homeless because his wife had passed away and he just kind of spiraled a little bit. But um, he was there every day, you know, uh, helping others who were having a hard time. So that's one, that's just one example. Um, let me see if I can go to the next one. This one is also uh, educational and, and, and they all had some aspect of the five principles. I'm just pulling out the, the ones that um, I think give a good example of what I mean. This one was more recent. It took place in 2018 and uh, there was a, a neighborhood in Richmond, which is where I was teaching at the time, called Highland Park. And Highland Park was um, probably one of the one neighborhood in the whole area that had more Queen Anne style homes than anywhere else. So they had this unique architecture. Um, it was a predominantly black neighborhood that was, um, was starting to get gentrified. And so the people there were concerned because they're trying to, to keep control of their neighborhood. And they had several programs in place. And this one was the Six Points Innovation Center. It's something they started for the youth there. And the youth had a say in the design of the space, what they wanted to see in the space. So they had several different programs there, but they didn't have an art program. So they asked if we would come in and I brought some of my students in. I had a class, I think of about six students and it was a community-based art course. And so um, we talked with them and what we decided on together was to create alphabet books that would highlight not only the Richmond community, the broader community, but the Highland Park community as well. And the idea was for them to collaborate on creating these alphabet books and then keep two of the books at the center, give two to the public library for adults to access, and then two to the library at the elementary school in the neighborhood. And so it was a really fun project, but it, it's also one of those things where it was a huge space with no dividers in it. And so all these other programs were going on at the same time. So sometimes kids would come and work with us, sometimes they wouldn't, but it took a semester, but we wound up making six books and each person walked away with a book of their own. So my students all walked away with a book. Um, the youth all walked away with a book. And then we had a big um, celebration and sharing with the neighborhood where we read from the alphabet, which was another important piece of this. It's important to have a sharing or celebration because that's how um, that good feeling and learning and understanding that happened with the participants then moves out to the broader community. Uh, so they had created two alphabets, one for the young children and one for adults. These are some other pictures of the project. So you can see what some of the books look like. You can see the youth working with some of my students trying to figure out, okay, what should P stand for? What should S stand for? And so they collaborated on what they wanted the alphabet to, um, to express. So reciprocal, this is the most recent project that I was involved with. It was another community-based art course um, with my students. And we were asked to come in to, um, to work on an art project with the community around a health and wellness center that had just opened. And I think they did the right thing. So um, before the university opened this wellness center, they did a series of town halls with the neighborhood where they wanted to open it. So this was a neighborhood that was like a food desert. They didn't have any um, medical facilities. Uh, so there were a lot of things that, um, that they just did not have, a lot of services that they should have had, but didn't. And so they talked to people about what they would like to see. And what wound up happening was they built this wellness center. So it's not a clinic, but it's a place to get, um, information and screening and things like that. 
Um, so they built this wellness center and above it, they built apartments. Then next to it, they built a really nice grocery store. And then across the street, a culinary arts school was going up. So we came in and they asked us what sort of project we'd like to do. So I said, well, I've got a lot of scrap material, so maybe we can do a quilt project. So this is another quilt project, but um, it's all based on cyanotype. So there are like photograms that we did with the folk who came in and wanted to work with us. So you see one woman there in the background. Um, we only had like three people from the community that would come on a consistent basis, but it was very um, reciprocal because the whole plan was all generated from the ground up from the participants and the students. So we asked a lot of questions. What sorts of things do you think about when you think about health and wellness? You know, what would you like to learn more about? What would you like people to know? So we came up with all these questions and they decided to do a quilt that focused on body, mind, and spirit. Because all of those things um, could contribute to a healthy lifestyle. And so each person's square, they got to select any aspect of that body, mind, or spirit that they wanted to, to work with. And so you see there's one, there's like um, breast self-exam there. There's one about condoms. There's one with, um, I'm trying to remember them all. There's one about um, healthy water systems. There's one about um, food, the food that you eat. And then I think I had a square in there. You can barely see it. it's down on the lower left, but it was um, like mindfulness, things that you can do, mindfulness practices for your, your mind and spirit. So that took a, a full semester, but the, the quilt now hangs in the center. So people who worked on it can come in and, and point it out to people in the community. And the door to the uh, grocery store leads right out from the wellness center, right into the grocery store. So there's a lot of traffic there now. So they were trying to get people involved in not only wellness uh, courses and information, but in arts courses as well as a, as a way of um, wellness. This project was a printmaking project. So I will say, yeah, I am a printmaker and this is one way that I feel uh, I can use my holistic sense of practice because as an artist, that's what I personally like to do. And when I can find ways to include that in my teaching and my research, that's just a great way to bring them all together. So this was one of the only times that I actually did a project in a school. And Angela can probably tell you there's a there's a lot of bureaucracy with schools. And so it's not always easy to um, to do a project in the school during the school day. But there were two middle school art teachers that we worked with. So they stayed after their classes twice a week for I think it was uh, six weeks. And we met with their art club and the boys and girls club from the school. And so they wanted to do a project around community. So we were asking them questions like to try to help them generate imagery, asking questions like, well, what's unique to the Richmond community? And one person said, well, there's a lot of railroads. <laughs> and another person said, well, there's the river. And so what they wound up doing was each person thought about what community meant to them, but they included some aspect of either the railroad or the river in their piece. So each person had a 12 by 16 inch wood block and um, they carved their image in after doing this whole word web envisioning process to figure out what they wanted their imagery to look like. And then we paste them all together in this jig. So you can see there's a jig down there on the lower left and two of my students have helped ink everything up and everybody got to drive the steamroller over the, over the piece. So we, we did several different combinations, some in color, some in black and white. And what you see down here is an exhibit. We had an exhibit at a local um, visual arts center where other people from the community could come in. But what was really fun about this project was we had um, an interview co a component. So everybody interviewed about what community meant to them and what they would like to see going forward with the community. And we took video clips of them actually working on their pieces. And then those all became part of an augmented reality piece that was part of the um, exhibition. So 
you know, it sounds a lot more techy than it is. And I'm not a really high tech person, but um, there's an app that you can get for augmented reality. And when we had the exhibit, we had two iPads with the app loaded on it. And you see a woman down there holding up her cell phone. She had the app loaded on that. And as she scrolled across that print, she could see a video pop up of the person who worked on that piece of the, of the, of the whole block. So I know that sounds probably kind of crazy, but anyway, this is one image. So you can see this was the railroad one. So everybody cut some piece of the railroad into it. Um, and then, as I say, as you hold up your uh, device to any one of those blocks, you can see the person either cutting on that block or inking that block or printing with the steamroller. So that was kind of a fun interactive way of um, getting other people involved in the exhibit. So the exhibit didn't just have the prints up, but they also wrote poetry about community. Their poems were up on the wall. There were photos of them working together. There was the augmented reality piece. And then we actually put up the tools as well. So people who came in and might be interested to see how this was done could get a little bit of education on that part. So empowering, this was, um, this was a project that I did with some of my students and we went to San Miguel de Allende for I think three different summers. And I, I specifically thought about empowering for this particular project because the girls we were working with had been abandoned by their families. So they had been abandoned by their families and they were living in um, a home run by nuns. So the girls ranged in age from uh, three to 19. And what we wanted to do was to, to give them ways of expressing themselves through art uh, so that they could feel better, I guess, about their situation and celebrate that they had this community together. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the book Madeline. It's a children's book about uh, a little orphan girl who lives in a home that is run by nuns. And there's one big room where they all sleep and there are all these beds lined up in a row. That is exactly what it looked like at this place. So each of these girls didn't really have much privacy. They just had their bed and they were trying to make it their, their little personal space any way they could. So one of the projects you're looking at was a celebration of the place and their community. So that was kind of like a 3D triptych mural that they created. And that's what you see is some of them making the, the stuff that they use to put on that 3D mural. But another year we went down and we had them um, take photos. We gave them digital cameras and told them to take photos of what they wanted people to see and know about them and their community. And then they came back with the photos and we ironed them onto material, which they then made into these soft pillows. And so that became what they put on their beds as their form of comfort and their story. Um, which was just a nice thing for them to be able to have. Also empowering. So this is one of the these. This is one of the projects that I did when I was at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland um, in 2019. So I went there and I was interested in how Brexit, like looking at how Brexit, it was impacting um, BIPOC people there, and making comparisons to the Trump administration in the United States. So um, this was right before Brexit had been finalized. So people were very worried, of course. And um, I wound up working with a group of youth aged 12 to 18 at um, a community in a community group called Score Scotland. And Score Scotland was basically, um, it, it was about uh, combating racism in Scotland. So these kids, all of them were immigrants from um, African and Southeast Asian countries. And when I first met with them, I just kind of wanted to get to know them. And they were telling me really horror stories about how they were treated in their neighborhood and how even their teachers were treating them. And I was thinking, wow, this project is gonna be pretty sad. These kids are gonna probably take all their angst out you know, in their artwork, but that wasn't what happened at all. What they wound up doing was creating these, they wanted to create alphabet books because I'd showed them some examples of what I'd done with um, the students in Richmond, but, that was what they decided to do, but they created an alphabet that was sort of like um, a mantra for how people should be with each other rather than the negative things. And I just took this little clip here because it says, 
W, wear your differences like a, a badge, you know, be proud of who you are. Don't let anyone, you know, make you feel bad about who you are. So they were an amazing group. And um, it was a very quick thing because it took me three months <laughs> of my time there to try to get the whole thing set up. And then we worked together for five sessions uh, every Saturday for five sessions. And then I was able to um, get an exhibit of their books at the art school library. Um, and they were so thrilled to go to the college and see their work on exhibit. So that, that was very empowering for them in a situation where they felt like they didn't have much power. You know, their teachers weren't very supportive. Neither was the neighborhood that they lived in. And then this was the first, I would say this was the first big woodcut project that I did. And it was truly collaborative and truly intergenerational. So if you can see here, people like tamping down the paper onto the wood block there, we had people aged from 10 to 70 <laughs> working on this project. And um, one of the things that I want to point out is it's, it's not really easy it's not easy at all really to do a community-based project because it's not like a school where you go in the classroom, you have a lesson plan, you know, you have standards, you have certain things you do, people are expecting things. Um, and you have somebody who's facilitating the whole thing and pretty much telling you this is how um, you should think about doing things. This was all voluntary, of course, and people, you know, we sat and told them that we were doing this big woodcut project and we were wanted to do it on the theme of freedom. So we were using, um, Franklin Roosevelt's Four Freedoms as a sort of an inspiration. And um, the older woman that you see in the front with the stripes on, she said, well, I really want to be involved with this, but I'm not at all interested in carving into a piece of wood. So this is where you have to think about, you know, what's meaningful for people. You have to make sure everybody has a role that's meaningful for them. And so I said, well, what would you like to do? And she said, well, I would really like to make a film. So I had a uh, graduate photojournalism student who was documenting the, the project for us. And I said, well, why don't the two of you get together and maybe you can come up with a plan for a film, you know, connected to what we're doing. And so she wound up creating this amazing film. And at the beginning, she, and she's got a wonderful voice she's uh, reciting a poem by Maya Angelou. And then she cuts in and she's interviewing each of us, you know, about our thoughts on freedom. And so it just became this wonderful thing. And then when we finished uh, all these woodcuts, there were four of them in total, like four feet by eight feet. We had this huge printing day out in the parking lot at the same time the farmer's market was going on. So we had a bunch of additional people coming in to help. She just got right down there and started helping with the printing and everybody drove the steamroller yet again. So what I will say is I learned, so I learn a lot each time I do one of these projects. And what I learned is when I did this one first and then did the other one that you saw with the middle schoolers is what happens with all of these weird pieces of wood? So we had a huge piece of um, wood and after they did their decision, there were like five people working on each of these four blocks of wood. Um, we asked them how they wanted us to cut it up so that each person, each of the five people had their own piece they were carving on to make this larger uh, collaborative image. And the, the pieces were really weird. Some of them had sharp points going out this way. They, they told us how they wanted us to cut it, so we did. But then, you know, you don't think about, well, what happens with all that wood in the end? Who's going to take those weird pieces home? A couple of people did, but we wound up discarding them after we made all the prints. So these are things to think about, right? But um, it was pretty uh, complicated and involved because it was my school, uh, my colleague at the University of Maryland, and then the, um, the ARC, which was this community center that we were working through. So there were three different institutions coming, to, coming together on this project. And each institution had a gallery space. So there was an exhibition at each place, which was really nice because it was um, a chance for other people in the different uh, communities that these institutions reside in to see what, what these people made and then to show the, the film. And here you see, um, another one of the, the woodcuts being pulled from the, after the steamroller printing is being pulled up, the paper's being pulled up from the, the matrix. And 
you can see the um, some of the woodcut pieces were actually on the wall in some of the uh, exhibitions. The tools were up. Um, the whole process was on exhibit so that people could see what it was all about. So it was pretty, pretty ex extensive. It took us a year to plan it. And then this one is also collaborative. So this was the project that I did at the Tate. So this, this was an odd situation. I, um, I had gotten the Fulbright and then I had an opportunity to apply to be the associate artist representing my university at the Tate Exchange. So we had just started this uh, partnership with the Tate Exchange. We were the only non-UK university or institution that was involved at the Tate Exchange. So I'm not even, I can tell you how it started, but you probably don't wanna hear all that. But so I was the second artist to go over and work in the Tate Exchange. So they give you like a week, you come up with a project that you want to do and they give you the space up on the fifth floor of the gallery to do the project. So um, as a printmaker and book artist, I've always been interested in altering books. And because I'd been in Edinburgh for about, five months before this came up, this was happening in July. So while I was in the UK, I did this after my Fulbright. Um, Edinburgh is a very literary city. So I just went into all the charity shops and I bought all these books. Most of them were classic texts uh, written from a master narrative point of view. And my idea was that I wanted people coming into the exchange floor to alter the books um, and create some sort of social justice message based on what they saw there, however that happened to inspire them. So I had 1800 people <laughs> in the course of five days. It was, it was pretty crazy. And um, the university was kind enough to let me take a graduate student with me to help me with this. So in that five days, those 1800 folk came in and worked in these books there were 30 books all told, and those books then wound up at um, the Tate Britain in their library. So that was a once in a lifetime thing. I'm not sure if I, I could do that again, but um, it was really quite interesting to see people, what, what they decided to do in these books and how they connected with other people who just were coming into the museum that day um, and, and engaging with them at a table around a bunch of materials. I think this might be the last one. So this is an example of transformative and uh, it's transformative because this project took place in Nicaragua in um, two, what I hate to term, but what they call trash dump communities. So what happened was there were um, two major trans trash dumps in Managua, Nicaragua, and people were allowed to squat in these trash dumps. They actually built like little towns almost in them. And so there were buildings, uh, homes, there were schools, there were churches. And uh, one of the churches there um, invited us to come in and do an arts and crafts based project with whoever was interested. And so the idea was to take some of the, the stuff that they were recycling. So the people were making a living by collecting the recyclables which is basically plastic bottles, um, glass, I think, but they were not collecting plastic bags. So we said, okay, so that's not gonna take away from their income, but what can we do with plastic bags? And so some of my students said, well, you can iron them and sew them together and make things. You can crochet with them. Another student was a, a sculpture student. He said, well, if there's scrap metal, I can show them how to make uh, jewelry. So what you see here is um, there's a picture of what the dump actually looked like. There's a picture of me uh, showing them how to crochet with um, plarn, as we call it, like plastic. And then they showed us how to make these amazing animals and bugs and things out of scrap wire. So it was definitely a reciprocal learning relationship. But what I found most transformative to me was, you know, you don't think about things often as deeply as you should before you go into some of these communities, because you just don't know if you've never had an experience like this, how would you know until you actually are in the middle of it. But I thought I could go to Nicaragua and buy some crochet needles, you know, and not have a problem. So I had one or two with me when I went down there, could not find any, could not find any except really tiny ones that you would use to make like lace doilies with or something. 
So I had this one crochet needle and a little boy you see there in the black was really interested in the crocheting. So I was showing him and I would give him the needle and he would do it. So then finally he went over to a bush. He broke off a little twig and I had some exacto knives with me for the um, paper beads that we were showing them how to make. And he literally whittled a crochet needle <laughs> right there on the spot. And I said, this is, this, it just blew my mind what people could do, how innovative they can be um, when they have a need, you know, for a certain tool. Uh, so that was one thing. And the student who uh, asked us to go, who helped set this whole thing up, went down two more summers and continued to work with them on their craftsmanship. And I don't have the pictures, I didn't include them all here, but the craftsmanship really, it just, it went up like this got to the point where they started selling these items to missionaries and tourists who were coming in there. And instead of each taking the money on their own and doing their own thing with it, they pooled it and they started a cooperative. And as far as I know, they are still making items and um, they were very malnourished. And now they, you know, they can, they can buy better food. Um, and I think it just kind of transformed them. And so they have more economic independence now. And that's what you want to do. You want to be able to work with people and let them take it off, take off on their own and, you know, do what they want to do with it to sustain it. So what are some of the steps in the CBAE process? How do you do it? So I, the, the best way that I can say that I've been successful at, is, at it is I've always tried to find somebody that I call a community connector. Someone that I know that has ties to the institution that I'm working with and to the community that I'm interested in collaborating with. So, you know, I, I, there was always somebody in that instance that had sort of like a, they were like a bridge, a bridge person. The next thing is to use theoretical and conceptual frameworks like the ones that I've talked to you about so that you can um, develop communal understanding, learn how to establish rapport and challenge people's assumptions, you know, you know, challenge your own assumptions about people. That's an important step, you know, write down what are, what are your stereotypical thoughts about a community and to do that asset mapping so that you uh, go in with the right frame of mind. Plan a project where everybody has a meaningful stake or voice. And like I said, the one woman who didn't want to make the woodcut, but, you know, ask her, what else do you, would you like to do? Um, dig beneath surface understanding of the creative process and the resulting product to try to foster a transformative learning experience because you want everybody to walk away with this feeling like this is the best thing that they could have been involved with and share, publish, exhi exhibit, and celebrate. That is the most, one of the most important steps is after going through all this work, find a way to share it with the broader community so that people involved can talk about what they learned and, and spread that to other people in their community. And finally, establish and evaluate learning outcomes, enduring understandings and next steps. What did you learn from it? So as I mentioned to you, the next time I did a woodcut project, I learned from the, you know, the little weird things that happened in the first one that I didn't want to repeat. Um, so now what I have here on the screen is basically, if you have a device where you can take a picture of that QR code, there are some community-based art education articles there that you might find helpful. And my email, if you'd like to contact me and my website. And I also have um, links to the videos for three of those projects. Um, if you want to see what people thought about them. <laughs> and then the book that uh, my colleagues and I authored about our experience doing community-based art education. So I don't know if there are any questions um, or comments. I don't know how much time I took. Is that enough time that's for me? Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Does anyone have a question? Did I leave you speechless? No, let's see, let's see anything in the chat. Oh, what? okay, thank you for those wonderful comments. Um, I would like to, to, to say one thing, if there are no comments, if you, um, I'll go beyond the screen. So I mentioned to you earlier how um, 
I see my art teaching and research practices all kind of intertwined. Um, if you would like to see an example of that, I can show you like two really quick ones. Um, so I like to make altered books. So what you see over here on the upper uh, right, left, sorry, I'm terrible with my directions. You can see my face and that's an altered book that I made um, because I was frustrated when I graduated from doctoral school because I didn't have time to make art. So I started this whole altered book about the adventures to becoming a college professor. And I knew my colleagues, my friends were going through the same thing. So I said, listen, I'm gonna start this. I'm gonna mail it to you do whatever you want in it, and then mail it to our other friend. So a year later, I got the book back. And um, so it's like this uh, collaboration in this one book. So then I wound up using that as a teaching tool. So ever since I have had my students create altered book journals, right? Either about um, what we're talking about in class, or whatever they want to do. They can do material exploration in it and they love it. I will say I had one student who said, we're tearing up a book that's horrible. But she was, she'd been an English major before she got into the program. And now, you know, I've heard from her since. She says, Pam, I do this all the time. So that's one way in which my personal art practice inspired my teaching practice, right? In terms of my curriculum. And then this one was um, a printmaking class. I taught a class on printmaking for educators. And uh, I was showing them a bunch of non-toxic printmaking techniques. And the last thing we did was a woodcut. And I said, what would you all like to do? Would you like to do a collaborative piece? And they said, yes, yes, let's do an exquisite corpse. And you have to do it with us because there's 12 of us that way. So I said, okay. So we wound up doing these uh, 24 inch wide, 48 inch long exquisite corpses. And it was so much fun. And people in the department wanted to buy them. And I said, well, wait, let's see. Maybe we should have an exhibit somewhere. So we wound up having a, an exhibit in the community. But before all that happened, um, I had a former student who was teaching at an HBCU. Uh, and I just thought it was funny because she's a, a young white woman and she was teaching mostly black students. And here I was a black woman teaching mostly white students. And I said, you're teaching a printmaking class. I'm teaching this printmaking class to teachers. What if we did a portfolio exchange with our two classes? So uh, we asked our students what sort of theme they would like the, the portfolio to revolve around. And they said, cycles, cycles. So what wound up happening as a part of the class is the students each created enough prints for everyone in my class and my, my former students class. And so they had this portfolio exchange and then all the works went up into this community gallery. But then, <laughs> The next part of that is you might be able to see up in the upper right, there's um, an article. So the student who was assisting me, I had a student who in the class who was assisting because she was a printmaker. And so she was helping with some of the teaching. I said, would you like to write an article? Let's write an article about how printmaking, you know, um, is a way of learning and, and how it develops community because that's what we've done in this class. So we wound up writing an article together. So this is just an example of how personal art practice then rolled into the teaching and then rolled into research through this article. Um, and the last one is this, this is a project that I'm currently working on. Um, I feel like it's always great for my students to hear from people that I feel are my mentors. And so I started this project, I'm not even gonna say how long ago it was, but it was a while ago where I went and interviewed my art educators and I got pearls of wisdom from them and I videotaped them. And so then I used that videotape parts of it in my class, in my teaching. And then I thought, wouldn't it be great if I made portraits of them? And so at some future point, I'm hoping to exhibit the portraits um, with their videos. So that's one way that I've pulled in um, you know, sort of like a, a research project with art making. So I will go back up to this page. But um, if there aren't any questions, I'm sorry there aren't any, but you know, yeah, do get, one. yeah. Do good. One, yes. <laughs> um, would you like to talk a little bit about the relation between socially engaged art practice and community-based art education? Yes. So, um, 
I think that they do intersect, at least for me, they intersect. So you think about people who are um, artists or teaching artists or artists for whom their practice is rooted in um, community themes or social justice themes. And I'm thinking about this because tomorrow I'm hosting Sonia Clark at my university or my college. And that's the type of work that she does. So I don't know how many of you are familiar with her, but uh, she doesn't necessarily, you know, take her students out into the community to do work. Her own art practice has to do with, you know, having the community take part in it. So I don't know how many might be familiar with her um, unraveling where she took the Confederate flag and started unraveling it. And it's up, it was up in a gallery and she invited people to come in and continue unraveling. So um, that speaks to, you know, what is the, that's, what does that symbol mean? What does it mean to people who look like Sonia Clark and myself? Um, how can she engage people in um, what that means and the impact of that, um, having that symbol around for other people and having this conversation while they're, while they're making art. So for me as an art educator, um, who's also involved in what I'd say is socially engaged practice, my thing is I like to see the people making the art themselves. So it's not just about my art or bringing my art into the community and engaging people in it um, and having their participation, but they are actually the artists as well. So I think that there's definitely some intersection there, but for me, the art pr project that results is not, you know, like my art, it's their art. Uh, and I'm not going to say that Sonia would say that she'd probably, I mean, it is her art, but it's also participatory, participatory. So the art was made by people participating in her art project. Um, so I would say in this case, it's more like talking to the community about what they want to do. There's obviously some limitations because, you know, of money, you know, you might have certain materials that you've got to use. You might not be able to say whatever material you want to use, you know, if, you, if what you've got is material to make a quilt or, you know, wood to do a woodcut or photography or whatever you're doing, that's what you have. But they have some say in terms of what it is they want to do with that and how they want to collaborate on it. And they are making the art. So I think for me, that's probably the biggest difference it's socially engaged, it is socially engaged, but it's not like um, an artist is coming into the community and participating with them on something that's really gonna wind up being more like their art or about their own art practice. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you. And I was also wondering, um, how do you see your role as an art educator in this community setting? I mean maybe elaborate more on this idea that you were talking about between, you know, the artist as going into the community working and it was, you know, the artist's work, but having community members involved. How do you see your role as an art educator then facilitating in a different way? I think as an art educator, I'm embedded in the community where my institution is. So if I were a socially engaged artist, I might you know, be going to a lot of whole lot of different places. And I'm not gonna say I haven't because I have been to a lot of different places, but I think the educator part of my role is to try to build sustainable partnerships between my institution and the community that it sits in. Because they're sitting on land, they've taken away from a neighborhood, you know, whatever, and they need to find a way to give back. And I think that you have a better understanding if you continue going in to work with the same community repeatedly over and over again. And that's how you really, you know, through sustained interaction can build rapport and trust with that community. So I think that's part of the difference because often like the, uh, a socially engaged artist might go in and work with one community for a short term, and then that project is totally over. So like the thing with the Nicaragua thing, that was that was their project. That, that wasn't our project. And they used that to continue, you know, to thrive, um, to sustain it. So a lot of times an artist will say, well, you know, I did that project once, that was that, I'm gonna move on and do something else. 
um, and they, they still might consider it their project. Whereas in this case, it's the community's project and we were working with them on it. You know, as educators, we were showing them a couple of skill sets and they showed us some things, um, but then people took it in whatever direction they wanted to take it in. So uh, I would say part of the big difference is, is what is the impact some of this is gonna have on the community? Like, like I was saying, it's important to have this sharing and celebration because you want to see where that goes, you know, so you start and going out like this, where does that sharing go? What happens with it? Um, and typically, you know, unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately and fortunately, I've left VCU because I was planning to continue to work with that Highland Park community um, over and over again. And they wanted me to continue running a, a, an art project out of the, of the wellness center. So I'm hoping that someone else will certainly take it up on the faculty there, but, um, that's, that's part of it. I would like to really embed and, and have sustained partnerships with the community around the institutions where I work. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I think everyone enjoyed your experiences and sharing all these wonderful ideas that you have and and how you, you know, the importance of connecting with communities and sustaining that connection um, is so important. It really is. Um, I mean, there are times when you have a one-off project and maybe that's what it's meant to be. Um, there are certainly lots of those in, in some of the articles that um, I included in this QR code. But and what really happens if you know you're gonna be somewhere for a while as Angela will say, cause she's been there for a while. You want to make a connection that's sustainable cause you know that's where you can make a real impact. And then those people also make an impact on you and your students, you know, who are gonna, some of them hopefully stay in the area and become educators um, not too far away. Okay, any other questions out there? I think that's it. Okay. Thank I so for... enjoyed it. That's so wonderful. <laughs> oh, thank you. I... Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I'm sure there will be others that will uh, view the lecture. Oh, that's there, good. There are many who can't make it on Mondays, but, um, you know, and we have other things going on other days during the oh, week. I'm sure. I get the same thing. So I uh, this is one thing I do like about this format is you can go back and look at it at your leisure. Yes. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. It's really great talk, Pam. I mean. Thank yeah. you, Angela. It's so good to see you. It's been forever. Yeah, I know.